Jesus to the high priest. All the chief priests and elders and scribes came together. Peter had followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he was sitting with the guards warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priest and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Yet even about this their testimony did not agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But he remained silent and made no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, son of the blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the son of man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garments and said, What further witnesses do we need? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. And some began to spit on him, and to cover his face, and to strike him, saying to him, Prophesy! And the guards received him with blows. So, this is our eighth week in, uh, in chapter 14 of the Gospel of Mark. And the reason why it's taking so long is simply because the setting and the context, well, they changed radically with the introduction to the Passover narrative, just like it changed radically once Yeshua, or you may call him Jesus, left Galilee and entered into the political and cultural reality of Jerusalem, the temple. And if you remember, it took forever to go through chapter one, too, because, you know, that required just a ton of background. Now, anyone who believes they can read the gospel as a contextual unity treating each part the same is going to miss a lot. And they're going to read into each section things that are not there. And especially this week. And, um, and next week too, um, because there, there is too much material to cover. Um, actually there was some that I actually didn't even fit in because I realized I had a entirely new uh, other page of notes when I was writing these two broadcasts. And, uh, and I forgot one, so we'll get to that when we do Matthew. All right. Now, now we're entering into the legal or maybe illegal realm of the Sanhedrin. Or was it a bait din of the high priest cronies? It's not crystal clear from the text. Nor is it entirely clear that they were entirely dishonest in their proceedings. Not entirely. Added to that, the debates over what exactly triggered the blasphemy charge. Now, I'm aware that people portray this as a very cut and dried incident, but it's anything but. And scholars freely acknowledge the paradoxes and difficulties with the trial narrative. You know, just like life itself, few things are entirely black and white. You know, we prefer our villains to be entirely without justification or virtue. But in this case, we have to settle for our hero being entirely justified and virtuous. You know, what I'm not going to do is cover this from the vantage of honor and shame culture, be except to make brief comments as things happen. You know, I did a broadcast that about two years ago, and I wrote about it in... Context for Kids, Volume 1, Honor and Shame in the Bible, where I outlined everything that happened and what it all meant from that vantage point. Um, not wanting to reinvent the wheel again. But beyond the context, this is a hard section for me to read and to teach. It isn't just a story. It's, it's what the love of my life endured, all right? Something he didn't want to endure, but did. I read it. But I hate it. I often cannot stop myself from bursting into tears. Although, hopefully I won't do that this time. It's because I've already got a stuffy nose. And that will make it impossible to record. You know, it, it's, it's hard to talk about how they abused him. There is nothing clinical or detached about this for me. You know, this is personal. And, well, it should be personal. 
Uh, well, anyway, hi, I am Tyler Don Rosenquist, and welcome to Character in Context, where I teach the historical and ancient sociological context of scripture with an eye to developing the character of the Messiah. If you prefer written material, I have six years worth of blog at theancientbridge.com, as well as my six books available on Amazon, including a four-volume curriculum series dedicated to teaching scriptural context in a way that even kids can understand it, called Context for Kids. And I have two video channels on YouTube with free Bible teachings for both adults and kids. <clears throat> you can find the link for those on my website. Past broadcasts of this program can be found at characterincontext.podbean.com and transcripts can be had for most broadcasts at theancientbridge.com and I post those on Fridays. If you have kids, I also have a weekly broadcast where I teach them Bible context in a way that shows them why they can trust God and how he wants to have a relationship with them through the Messiah. Now, all scripture this week comes courtesy of the ESV, the English Standard Version, but you can follow along with whatever Bible you want. A list of my resources can be found attached to the transcript for part two of this series at theancientbridge.com, and I'm constantly adding to it because, you know, I keep buying more books. And, and of course, whenever I have an article, I add it in there with the links. So... This week we are in Mark 14 again, and as I've said so many times, you're probably bored and you've got it memorized. It is the longest chapter of Mark by far. It's one of the longest chapters in the Bible. Now, this week and next, in addition to the normal commentary list, I'm going to be drawing heavily from three sources. The Kahati Commentary on Tractate Sanhedrin which details the legal procedures of the Supreme Court of Israel, albeit from the vantage point of over 150 years later. Um, I'm also going to be talking about the incredibly excellent blasphemy and exaltation in Judaism, the charge against Jesus in Mark 14, verse 53 to 65, by Daryl L. Bach. And that is very scholarly, not re light reading, not for a beginner. And an article entitled, titled Beit Din, Boule, Sanhedrin, A Tragedy of Errors by the late great scholar Ellis Rivkin of the Hebrew University. And I will link to that article in the transcript as well as his scholar site where you can read more of his amazing articles for free. Okay. I am going to tell you right now that what we see in the trial of Yeshua when compared to Tractate Sanhedrin in the Mishnah, and according to the Talmudic commentaries as well, it's clearly illegal on a number of levels. Okay, according to that tractate. From the fact that it's held at night, occurring during a festival, a judgment of capital crime without waiting long enough, the location, and the fact that it is presided over by the Sadducean high priest, well, it reeks to high heaven, all right? Tractate Sanhedrin covers the proceedings of the Sanhedrin court, right? Well, if so, then why does the word Sanhedrin only occur in the tractate three times while the term Beit Din is mentioned 19 times? And in the supplementary text, it's even more striking. Beit Din is mentioned 245 times and Sanhedrin is only mentioned 23 times. The question that Rivkin, Ellis Rivkin, asks is very important, and he's a Jewish scholar. He's a, he was an expert on Jewish history, and he did a lot of work in the New Testament. He asks, was this a meeting of the group that would formerly meet in the Chamber of Hewn Stone, or was this an entirely different sort of tribunal called the Sanhedrin, but different from what is described in the Mishnah? So, first off, we see a gathering of all of the chief priests and the elders and the scribes. And it is actually possible for all these to be sitting on the court as described by the Mishnah in theory. All right. Now, verse 55 makes mention of the chief priest and the whole council. And that word for council is Sanhedrin, which is... um Suedrian, 
in Greek. Okay, this is one of the many legislative terms that the Jewish people picked up from the Greeks who were obsessed with all things legal and governmental. You know, it was um, it was actually during the Greek occupation that Torah shifted from being wisdom literature aimed at teaching good judicial practices and mindsets to judges into becoming actual codified hard legislation. The more Hebraic and ancient Near Eastern way of looking at the Torah would be as wisdom literature. And it is more Hellenistic to codify everything and legislate everything down to the minutia. And I'm not talking about making formal law codes. I mean, I think society definitely needs them. We prove it all the time. But it wasn't how it was originally written. This is why Yeshua made mention of the allowances given by Moses in Mark 10, when it comes to human hard-heartedness and laws that make allowances for hard-heartedness. Okay, it was during and after Hellenistic times that we see factions, or what Josephus called philosophies, uh, sprouting up within Judaism in the form of the Sadducees, Pharisees, and Essenes, and later on, the Zealots. When things began to get nailed down and codified, okay, uh, that's when people start jockeying for power and position and groups begin posturing and claiming deeper roots than other groups and therefore, you know, more authority. Each of these groups claim to be the true transmission from Sinai. And of course, that's a big deal. Um, now, Rivkin points out brilliantly that the body described in Tractate Sanhedrin could not have functioned as it was claimed during the Second Temple times because there was absolutely no accord, no um, room for agreement uh, between the Sadducees and Pharisees over religious matters. Although they could function together over social and political issues, they had no basis for coming together in order to have a unanimous decision on anything. In the Mishnah, we see a uh, debate, but along the same lines of thought, they agreed on the basics, but differed on minor issues. As we see in Acts 5 and 22, when the Pharisees and Sadducees sat together on a council, they ended up in bitter disputes with one another, and became unable to render a group decision based on their lack of agreement on religious issues. Issues. Now, what happened with Yeshua and the council at the high priest's home was a religious interrogation that led to a unanimous agreement. So, what is the difference between a Sanhedrin and a Beit Din? Or should I say the Beit Din? Now, our two First century sources are the Gospels and Acts and Josephus. When Josephus uses the word Sanhedrin, it does not refer to an ecclesiastical court described in the Mishnah. Instead, it refers to a more generic political gathering drawn together by ruling authorities with some goal in mind. Think of a committee meeting. Um, it is therefore a Sanhedrin and not the Sanhedrin with set members and rulership. But this is a council that does not operate directly under God um, or without limitations. That would be instead the Beit Deen, okay? The Beit Deen is what we de see described in the Torah as consisting of judges who are directly authorized by the king of Israel under the king and the high priest to whom the populace owed absolute obedience to their rulings. This is the authority claimed in Tractate Sanhedrin. And let me get those verses in Deuteronomy for you. This is Deuteronomy 17, verses 8 through 13. Oh, I love January and I know. <laughs> If any case are requiring decision between one kind of homicide and another, one kind of legal right and another, or one kind of assault and another, any case within your towns that is too difficult for you, then you shall arise and go up to the place that the Lord God will choose. And you shall come to the Levitical priests 
and to the judge who is in office in those days, and you shall consult them, and they shall declare to you the decision. Then you shall do according to what they declare to you from that place that the Lord will choose. And you shall be careful to do according to all that they direct you, according to the instructions that they give you, and according to the decision which they pronounce to you, you shall do. You shall not turn aside from the verdict that they declare to you, either to the right hand or to the left. The man who acts presumptuously by not obeying the priest who stands to minister there before the Lord your God, or the judge, that man shall die. So you shall purge the evil from Israel, and all the people shall hear and fear and not act presumptuously again. So really, I mean, what we're talking about is an anti-anarchy clause in, uh, in the Torah, an anti-book of judges clause, I suppose we could say. And this is going to be important when we talk about what the cause of the blasphemy charge was. This was the authority conferred upon the judges of Israel under the leadership of the high priest or, or king and or king. They were serving as the direct representatives of Yahweh on earth, having been consecrated and anointed with the holy oil. Couldn't just be any oil, had to be the holy oil. Um, what we need to understand is that during Second Temple times, there was no authorized and consecrated king from the line of David, nor was there an authorized priest. There hadn't been a Davidic king since before the exile. The third generation Hasmonean priest kings were presumptuous in the stream and wicked to boot. And uh, fa frankly, had been, thank goodness, had been deposed by the Romans. And the high priestly family during the life of Yeshua and afterwards paid Rome for the position. They were collaborators. Um, they were illegitimate as far as being divinely authorized goes. Nowadays, rabbinic authority often claims this level of legitimacy, but there is no king or high priest, and so there does not exist the same mandate. Well, I mean, there is one, but he is unrecognized for the most part within Judaism. So the Beit Din court was a seriously big deal, as they claimed authority and inspiration directly from Yahweh. But the factional nature of pre-70 Judaism made it a mess. Now, what does Josephus say about a Sanhedrin? Um, and now Caesar, hearing upon hearing of the death of Festus, sent Albinus into Judea as procurator. And the king deprived Joseph, Cabe and Simon, of the high priesthood. And that was in 63 of the Common Era. I'm adding notes in. This isn't all. Josephus, um, and bestowed the succession to that dignity on the son of Ananus, um, who was the former high priest and father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was also himself called Ananus. Now, the report goes that this eldest Ananus proved a most fortunate man, for he had five sons who had all performed the office of a high priest to God, and who had himself enjoyed that dignity a long time formerly, which had never happened to any other of our high priests because they would all die in office, but we don't need to go there. He didn't say that. But this younger Ananus, Ananus, who, as we have told you already, took the high priesthood, was bold, was a bold man in his temper and very insolent. He was also of the sect of the Sadducees, who are very rigid in judging offenders above all the rest of the Jews, as we have already observed. When, therefore, Ananus was of this disposition, he thought he had now a proper opportunity to exercise his authority. Festus was now dead, and Albinus was but on the road. So he assembled the Sanhedrin of Judges and brought before them the brother of Jesus, who was called Christ, whose name was James, and some others, or some of his companions, and when he had formed an accusation against them as breakers of the law, he delivered them to be stoned. But as for those who seemed the most equitable of the citizens, and such as were the most uneasy at the breach of the laws, they disliked what was done. They also sent to the king Agrippa, desiring him to send to Ananus, that he should act so no more, for that 
what he had already done was not to be justified. Nay, some of them went also to meet Albinus, as he was on his journey from Alexandria, and informed him that it was not lawful for Ananus to assemble a Sanhedrin without his consent, whereupon Albinus complied with what they said, and wrote in anger to Ananus, and threatened that he would bring him to punishment for what he had done, on which King Agrippa took the high priesthood from him, when he had ruled but three months, and made Jesus son of Damnius the high priest. All right. So, a Sanhedrin in the time of Josephus was not a bait din, which could pronounce and execute a sentence. All right. A Sanhedrin operated at the discretion of the ruling authorities and could only decide whether or not a capital case could be bumped up to Rome. In this case, you know, Ananus had not only not been given the authorization by the new procurator to even assemble the council, but Ananus and the council had absolutely no authority to unilaterally convict and execute. And here we see a classic example of the infighting between the Sadducees and Pharisees that, although the non-Sadduceans were upset about the charges um, of their being antinomian, the, the disciples, um, you know, against the laws, they were uh, patently against the proceedings and found them to be unlawful. So this hastily gathered Sanhedrin did not meet the qualifications to be a bait din. And a bait din is what the council in the Gospels is often assumed to be because of the mislabeling, so Rivka believes, Rivkin, excuse me, um, of Mishnah Tractate to be referring to something that it was not. He believes that it should have been called Tractate Beit Din instead, based on oh, an overwhelming number of references within the documents to Beit Din and the relatively few about Sanhedrin. And not only that, but um, the marked differences between what he saw um, in Tractate Sanhedrin and what he saw in both Josephus and the New Testament, the Gospels and Acts. Okay, now... The Sanhedrin that Ananus gathered as it was operating outside the bounds of what was legal and what was objected to by its leading citizens who had no love for the accused, it's very unlikely that this um, Mark 14 group wasn't, uh, you know, it's very unlikely that it wasn't a gathering of uh, the high priest like-minded supporters. It was probably an all Sadducee council because it was very hard. It's very hard to believe that the Pharisees would have consented to such a thing. Determined as they historically were to uh, live and let live policy with the Roman authorities, except in the most dire of cases, as when Pilate brought in idolatrous standards to uh, Jerusalem overnight, and they were ready to be slaughtered wholesale rather than to allow them to stay. Um, in the same way, this charge against Yeshua that he was guilty of blasphemy and all who were there, you know, condemned him. But then we have this problem because in other scriptures, we see that Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus were council members. But which council? You know, and that's that's the big question here. Which council? And, and people... You know, scholars have been debating about it for a long time. There are a lot of excellent books. There are a lot of excellent papers. There are a lot of excellent theories. Um, and nothing is perfect, you know, because none of us, you know, were in the room. We didn't see the people. Uh, no one wrote anything out clearly. It, in a way, it doesn't matter because what matters with what happened. But it's important because I see uh, mischaracterizations a lot. And it's good to have as much information, you know, as we really can. You know, what was this? Was this a kangaroo court or was this an entirely different sort of um, thing altogether? And when we come back in the next half hour, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about what I think was going on and um, we'll see what you think too.
Tyler Don Rosenquist, and welcome back to this half of this week's character and context on, um, we're looking at the trial of Yeshua, you may call him Jesus, and whether or not um, it met the qualifications for what Tractate Sanhedrin calls a Sanhedrin, or um, more aptly named a Beit Din, or if it was just a uh, more of an informal sort of council. We've been talking about that, and um, now we're going to talk about I don't know about some things that show up in scripture that don't make sense. If it was a bait den, which is the formal um, the formal uh, legislative body that met in the chamber of hewn stone on the Temple Mount, um, because then we have some weird questions, like in Luke twenty three fifty, Joseph of Arimathea is described as a member of the council. But the word isn't related to the Greek for Sanhedrin, but instead the Greek for Beit Din. Boluterian. Uh, Joseph was a member of the Bolute. And that's the group that met in the chamber of hewn stone in the temple complex so as to be close enough to the presence of God to inspire fear and trembling over the justice and the righteousness of decisions. And based on Joseph of Arimathea being a follower of Yeshua and willing to become ceremonially unclean for the rest of the festival on his behalf, and not just unclean, but unclean with corpse impurity, which was the worst, and took a seven-day regimen to correct. This isn't the act of a man who was there and who condemned Yeshua of blasphemy. These are the actions of a man who wasn't there because the high priest took it upon himself to hold a hearing for the political purpose of finding something that would allow them to bump up the case to Rome. Which is why very little of what we see in this account lines up with Tractate Sanhedrin. Speaking of that, let's look at the deviations from Tractate Sanhedrin that we see in Yeshua's trial, and I, there may be more, but, um, I read, I reread Tractate Sanhedrin, and I just pulled out what I could think of, you know, just off the top of my head. Um, one, the high priest was clearly in charge. Now, the Beit Din, on the other hand, was ruled over by the Nasi, um, which is Hebrew word for prince, and that was the name they gave the president, and the Af Beit Din which is the father of the Beit Din, a.k.a. the Chief Justice. Now, according to the Mishnah, these were teams of two until Hillel the Great and Shammai, because in the absence of a king, there were changes made. Now, in Old Testament times, the king was the head of the court. And we get that in Sanhedrin 2.2. Here we have the high priest in charge, which never happened in this time period, nor should it have. Uh, Two, the Beit Din sat in one of the three courtrooms placed on or around the Temple Mount, depending on the type of case and how many judges were required to hear it. Now, the most famous of these was located in the uh, Lishkat Hagazit, um, also known as the Chamber of Hewn Stones, at the southwest corner of the Court of Israel in the Temple. This was a huge building that could seat 71 judges in a semicircle. Now, a case of the magnitude of Yeshua's, a blasphemy trial which involved the death penalty would certainly be held here, and absolutely not in an upper room of the house of the father of the current high priest. There was no particular sanctity associated with that location, and therefore it was unsuited as to such a legal proceeding. And that is from Sanhedrin 4.3. Three, capital cases, which are Cases requiring the death penalty upon conviction were judged by a minimum of 23, but 71 were required to be in attendance in case a close vote came up, and that's in 1.4. False prophet cases required the full bait din of 71 to sit in judgment, and that's 1.5. Four. Capital cases were specifically pursued with the intention of acquitting the accused, unless the burden of guilt was very great. Uh, That's in uh, 4.1. And the preliminary judgment phase opened up with a move to quit. 
uh, that's 5.4. Neither of these was the case as testimony shows them determined to convict, if not on the initial charges, which were not proven, then on new charges. 5. If an acquittal was ruled, the bait din adjourned for the night and the judges split up into groups of two who deliberated throughout the night while drinking no wine and eating very little food before coming back together the next morning. Upon the return, they strove to acquit the accused again. That's 5.5. This clearly didn't happen in Yeshua's trial. Six. If the accused was found guilty, before sentence was carried out, a crier would go out seeking further witnesses in order to try to secure a final acquittal. Obviously, this never happened, and Yeshua was rushed to Herod's palace, where Pilate spent the festivals and held court while in Jerusalem. On the other hand, we mustn't assume that this was a complete kangaroo court where their verdict was assured. As required, they interviewed the witnesses and found them to be not credible, as the standards for examination were actually quite intense. Testimony had to agree on the following details in order to be considered reliable. One, which seven-year period of the Jubilee cycle did the offense occur in? And that's the easiest one because it's like there are seven, you know, Shemitah seven-year cycles in the larger Jubilee, which is 49 or 50 based on, you know, what floats your boat. Um, so which one of those seven? That's the easy one because everyone would know that, okay? Um in what two, in what year of the Shemitah cycle did the offense happen? So in year one, two, three, four, five, six, or seven. Three, in which month? Four, which day of the month? Five, what hour? Six, I'm not sure if I could do what hour. I mean, imagine in like no watches. Uh, six, in what place? Uh, and these are all according to, uh, Sanhedrin 5.1. Now, that would be hard for me to answer correctly on just about anything, honestly. On top of that, all the details had to match up between the witnesses who were brought in one at a time. And I have to say that it is to the Sanhedrin's credit that the fix wasn't in because these witnesses could have easily been coached to give the same answers, but none of them could agree. Like I said earlier, these guys were being villains, but they weren't entirely acting corruptly. They did their due diligence with the witnesses, you know, which tends to surprise people. It surprised me because I'd always been told they hadn't. Uh, they had a verdict they wanted to arrive at, but they didn't do what it took to guarantee it. Now, I believe that Rivkin made his case admirably that this was a temporary political Sanhedrin pulled together in the middle of the night by the high priest for the purpose of making a case to bring before Pilate for Yeshua's execution. As such, he could pick and choose whom he wanted to invite from amongst his cronies, probably people who had actually been at his Seder, right? Uh, so that he could get the vi verdict that he wanted uh, at the end without any dissension. So let's look at what the Talmud claims uh, really quick in Sanhedrin 43a, and this is the Gemara on the Mishnah, which is a commentary on the rulings. The Mishnah teaches that a crier goes out before the condemned man. This indicates that it is only before him, i.e., while he is being led to his execution, that yes, the crier goes out, but from the outset, before the accused is convicted, he does not go out. The Gemara raises a difficulty, but isn't it taught in a Bereda? On Passover Eve, they hung the corpse of Jesus the Nazarene after they killed him by way of stoning. And a crier went out before him for 40 days, proclaiming publicly, Jesus the Nazarene is going to be going out to be stoned because he practiced sorcery, incited people to do idol worship, and led the Jewish people astray. Anyone who knows of a reason to acquit him should come forward and teach it on his behalf. And the court did not find a reason to acquit him, and so they stoned him and hung his corpse, corpse on Passover Eve. Allah said, And how can you understand this proof? Was Jesus the Nazarene worthy of conducting a search for a reason to acquit him? He was an insider to idol worship. 
And the merciful one states with regard to an insider to idol worship, neither shall you spare, neither shall you conceal him. Deuteronomy 13.9. Rather, Jesus was different as he had close ties with the government and the Gentile authorities were interested in his acquittal. Consequently, the court gave him every opportunity to clear himself so that it could not be claimed that he was falsely convicted. Um, and this is from safaria.org. I have the link in the transcript. Of course, this doesn't line up with either the Gospels or with Josephus. Um, the first century witnesses, you know, but uh, was written... What, what, uh, the, the Gemara was written just under 600 years later by the Jewish rabbinic scholars in Babylon. But it's interesting in that it seeks to justify the ver verdict by placing it within the context of a Beit Din ruling. Yet, during a period when we have seen from Josephus and the situation with high priest Ananus and the execution of James, the brother of Yeshua, that they didn't have the authority to perform such an independent ex execution in the first place. They had to go through the established Roman authorities. In Antiquities 18.3.3, and even when the later Christian edits were removed, uh, Josephus claims that Yeshua was crucified by the Romans under the leadership of Pontius Pilate instead of the much later Talmudic claim that he was stoned. And this is from the Loeb's version. About this time there lived Jesus, a wise man, if indeed one ought to call him a man, for he was one who performed surprising deeds and was a teacher of such people as accept the truth gladly. He won over many Jews and many of the Greeks. He was the Messiah. And when, upon the accusation of the principal men among us, Pilate had condemned him on to the cross, those who had first come to love him did not cease. He appeared to them, spending a third day restored to life, for the prophets of God had foretold these things and a thousand other marbles about him, and the tribe of Christians, so-called after him, has still not to this day disappeared. All right. And so this was obviously um, edited by later Christian scribes, because although Josephus is almost universally recognized as being tampered with, uh, people still, like, believe this. Um, there was also discovered in... Um, the 1970s, an Arabic version of Josephus that doesn't have the disputed edits and almost certainly reflects what a Jewish retainer of the emperor's family would have written. You know, or he'd die. At this time, there was a wise man who was called Jesus and his conduct was good and he was known to be virtuous. And many people from among the Jews and other nations became his disciples. Pilate condemned him to be crucified and to die, and those who had become his disciples did not abandon his discipleship. They reported that he appeared to them three days after his crucifixion and that he was alive. Accordingly, he was perhaps the Messiah concerning whom the prophets had recounted wonders. And I linked the article that, that I got that from because I was having trouble finding my Arabic Josephus link. Now, the important thing to note is that the important stuff remains the same. Yeshua was condemned and crucified on the authority of Pontius Pilate. Josephus was not a follower of Yeshua, but was a reporter of history, and he was born within a decade of the crucifixion and was a priest. He certainly would have been more than familiar with the early believing community and the scandal of the surrounding events. What he wouldn't have done is to tell someone who was dubbed Divi Filius or a.k.a. the son of God, a.k.a. his patron, the emperor Titus, um, he wouldn't have told him that Yeshua was definitely the anointed one who was a threat to Roman rule over his homeland, and he was still alive, by the way. Um, things were bad enough already. Josephus instead paints Yeshua as a miracle worker, something the Romans and all ancient peoples believed in and admired as the emissaries of the gods. They weren't particular about the gods in question, as they accepted a great many of them, and though, uh, and they thought the Jews to be odd and even atheistic for their insistence that there was only one. So it's believed that a later Christian scribe edited Josephus, and because those manuscripts were the ones that were copied and recopied by the early church, they became the only transmission available until Arabic Josephus popped up 50 years ago. So that was a great archaeological find. 
Um, you know, it's like anything on the internet. Just because it um, holds with your position doesn't mean it's wasn't doesn't mean it's true. <laughs> people on you know my side, people on your side, they lie. <laughs> okay, so what is it that we have here? Was the trial illegal? Well, not if it was wasn't an actual bait den, and since it doesn't reflect almost any of the qualifications, it's doubtful that it constituted a trial at all. Really, it seems more likely that it was like a grand jury hearing with a stacked jury. And if you aren't familiar with what a grand jury here is in America, it's a preliminary hearing where prosecutors bring their evidence in front of a group of randomly selected people in order to see if they can make a case against the accused person for an indictment. If the answer is yes, then they can go to trial. Although this was not a random selection, but a Sanhedrin convened by the high priest, it served the same function. Could they find damning enough evidence against Yeshua to bring him before the only person who had the authority to put him to death? They knew they only had one shot at this because if they arrested him and couldn't make anything stick, they would be in hot water with the populace who was dazzled by him. And although the arrest in and of itself was shameful in ancient society where you were considered guilty until proven innocent, um, I mean, at least in a social way, uh, even more shameful would be for the elites to fail in pressing a successful case against him. After all, he already humiliated them, and in the temple courts no less. He was rising in esteem, and they were falling. If you're familiar with honor-shame cultures, you know that having a low honor or losing your honor was a fate worse than death. You know, and to be at the pinnacle of your people, as far as status goes, and then to sink lower and lower beneath a poor Galilean of questionable birth? If they had less honor than Yeshua, then they would lose control of the people, and during that time, to lose control of the people meant to lose their position with Rome, because Rome would replace them with whoever could work. Now, Caiaphas was the son-in-law of Annas, who was high priest from the time that Rome took over direct power over Judea in six of the Common Era, um, when um, Archelaus was deposed, Herod's son Archelaus, until 15 of the Common Era. He was appointed by Quirinius, the legate of Roman Syria, and was the very first high priest officially owned by Rome. Um... I think. Yeah, pretty sure. Although he was removed from office by Valerius Gratus, Annas was the power behind the priesthood for almost half of the years between 6 and 70 of the Common Era. Five of his sons served as high priests, but the most successful was Joseph, son of Caiaphas, a.k.a. Caiaphas that we find in the Bible. That was his son-in-law. He was high priest for 18 years, from 18 to 36 of the Common Era, the longest lasting of all first century high priests because he was a political mastermind, and especially combined with his father-in-law, Annas. He had great relations with Rome and was very good at keeping the Judeans in check. So when we look at this middle-of-the-night hearing, this sort of smart political move we would expect from their combined efforts of, you know, keeping the peace and keeping power. This is exactly the kind of thing they would do, okay? Um, Yeshua had to go for uh, the latter, and they suspected for the former as well, for them to keep the peace and keep power, right? Especially since Yeshua more resembled the Pharisees who were very popular with the people, and really had very little common with the Sadducees who were in control of the high priesthood. Now, Yeshua had a beef, yes, with the Pharisaic traditions of men that drew away from the heart of Scripture and missed the point oftentimes in their striving to achieve legal perfection and temple-level cleanliness. But Yeshua made reference to the Psalms and the prophets that the Sadducees did not see as authoritative. Yeshua preached about the resurrection and the world to come, which the Sadducees denied and absolutely flouted, you know, with their worldly lifestyle and their oppression of the poor. Now, a figure like Yeshua, 
clearly appealing to the people's messianic hopes, you know, which were a threat to Roman interest and power, you know, and he's endowed with miracle working authority and whose preaching was just overwhelming the hum arets. Um, the people of the land, you know, and even many of the Pharisees, including council members, you know, he just spelled out doom for the family of Annas and the chief priest and to those who were currently enjoying the perks of Roman rule. So you need to know that the Sadducees were already unpopular and that the Pharisees were the ones who decided how to do things as far as temple rituals. As the Sadducees only looked at the Torah as being author authoritative to the temple cultists, and don't think in ter when I say cultists, don't think in terms of wackiness, but cultists in terms of uh, how worship was conducted. That's what cultists means. It's the trappings of worship, okay? They strenuously objected to all the pomp and circumstance that was not directly referenced in the Torah. For example, they objected to the water pouring ritual at Sukkot, and when a Sadducean high priest, Alexander Janaeus, purposefully messed it up, uh, the pilgrims in attendance tried to stone him with their atrogs, you know, the lemon things. I know it's not a lemon, but it looks like a lemon, okay? Now, Yeshua, on the other hand, actually referenced the ceremony by calling himself the reality of it in the Gospels. Not only at the Passover Seder, but when he referenced the watered-down wine that was his blood of the New Covenant, um, also in Sukkot, in John 7.37. Um, you know, there was more at stake than meets the eye. He says, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters and drink. You know, um, so I want to read the account uh, the trial account one more time. And then uh, next week, we're actually going to talk about it verse by verse, like like normal. But I want you to see if, you know, based on what we've talked about, if it reads differently to you now and not, not so cut and dry as before, or cut and dried. Uh, starting in verse 53 of uh, Mark chapter 14, and they led Jesus to the high priest. Red flag. <laughs> High priest shouldn't be in charge. And all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together. And Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he was sitting with the guards and warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council, Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea, and why were the chief priests there? You know, they were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death. But they found none. Now, no one should be seeking evidence to put someone to death. Remember, the bait then was focused on acquittal, if possible. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. And some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, um, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. But even about this, their testimony did not agree. Now, that's good that they're actually following evidentiary rules okay this wasn't totally bad and the high priest stood up in the midst and asked jesus which he wouldn't do in a bait den have you no answer to make what is it that these men testify against you remember he wouldn't have authority in that body uh but he remained silent and actually they should have quitted at that point because they had no witnesses in agreement so the trial's over if it was a, if it was a trial um, but he remained silent and made no answer and made no answer again. The high priest asked him, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? Um, and Jesus said, I am, and you will see the son of man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garments, which high priests are never supposed to do and said, what further witnesses do we need? You have heard this blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving, deserving death, which, you know, there's a problem there. And some began to spit on him and cover his face and strike him and saying to him, prophesy. And the guards received him with blows. All right. Next week, we're going to talk about that trial in detail. And uh, I'll see you then.